Where most of us see obstacles and limitations in this time of COVID, some of our fellow creatures see opportunity. Faith Saley considers the curious case of the very curious raccoon. While millions of us these days settle in, these critters, with their masks on, venture out. In fact, this is kind of the interesting thing about the coronavirus is that now people are beginning to see animals that they didn't see before. We were very close to him. We're going to loop back around again. Stan Garrett is a professor at Ohio State University and has tracked raccoons for over 20 years. We put radio collars on them and we follow them as they move around the city. I've watched my study animals disappear as they were riding on top of a garbage truck. <laughs> I've had people email me and say that raccoons are evil geniuses out to destroy them. They're not. <laughs> raccoons are not evil geniuses. They are not even geniuses. They are lovely little critters trying to make a living. Suzanne McDonald teaches psychology and biology at York University in Toronto and says that raccoons' uniquely sensitive front paws, some might even call them creepy hands, are part of their success as a species. If you see a raccoon in a river where they evolve, they put their hands under the water and they feel food. It's why raccoons are commonly thought to wash their food. They don't really wash their food, even though their scientific name actually is the bear who washes with their hands. The ends of their paws are more sensitive underwater that they can actually get a good image of what they're, they're feeling and they can kind of see it with their fingers and then they can eat it. Raccoons are constantly reaching out and grabbing things because, unlike many animals, they're intensely curious. For many other wild animals, when there's a strange object out there, they have a healthy fear of that. But raccoons are actually attracted to, to new novel objects, shiny objects, things that are not normal in the landscape. This attraction to the new and shiny is what Garrett calls neophilia. So because of their intelligence and their willingness to try new things, really we're just an opposable thumb away from raccoons being our overlords? That's something that we think about every now and then. It's like if they had an opposable thumb, they might be competition for us. McDonald exploited the fact that raccoons don't have opposable thumbs when she volunteered to help the city of Toronto create a raccoon-proof compost bin. And it worked. Until a curious raccoon made Toronto's morning news. There's no way he can get into it, right? It smells good in there. There's no... Oh. Really? <laughs> Was it disheartening to see raccoons get into your raccoon-proof compost bin? Actually, it wasn't disheartening at all. I thought it was fantastic, and I was so cheering for them to do it because, you know, it kind of shows that they can overcome everything. If city raccoons are more wily than their country cousins, McDonald says we can thank ourselves. So over generations of time, we are actually creating the perfect urban raccoon, the perfect urban warrior, because we are making it harder and harder and harder for them to get into our trash bins and get into our houses and get into those things we don't want them to get into. And those animals that do that end up surviving and they are the smart ones. So it is kind of our problem <laughs> that we've created. The lesson of this raccoon tale? The love-hate relationship between people and raccoons isn't going anywhere. Because our crafty, curious neighbors are going everywhere. So it's worth asking. What can we learn by watching raccoons? I think you can learn persistence. That's what I've learned from them. It's like, if you just don't give up, eventually you'll get into that trash can. It's just, you just gotta keep working at it.